Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Novogen guest webinar. Uh, it's a great honor to choose special guest speaker, Dr. Chen and Dr. Niu, to for you my patience with us. Chen Shi, manager of Kenya, introduced the group uh, Dr. Chen is a social professor from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and he will talk human microbiome map in Hong Kong today. And uh, our second speaker is Dr. Nirajan. He's the associate director and group leader from Genome Institute of Singapore. And uh, his research is uh, about skin microbiome dermat uh, dermatypes stratified atopic dermatitis patients. Uh, during our webinar, if you have any questions, please uh, submit your questions in the messaging box. And if we don't have enough time to reply, uh, our colleagues will contact you after webinar. Uh, okay, next I would take to take some time to introduce Novogen to you. Uh, Novogen is a global leader in NGS services. Uh, founded in 2011 and headquartered in Beijing, China, uh, our mission is to use advanced genomics to improve life and human health. Uh, as you can see, our uh, prisons and labs are around the world, and we have uh, labs uh, located in Singapore, China, US, and the UK. Our regional, uh, AMIAN regional headquarters is located in Singapore. Uh, we provide uh, a service to Pacific East and Africa also a uh, region through the local partners. So why should you choose Novogen services? Firstly, we have dedicated professional local technical support team. They have rich experience in solving various problems. And last year, we launched our uh, real-time customer ser service system in CSS. You can track your project status, submit sample information, and download your uh, report and uh, download your data release. Uh, and uh, this, year, this year is also uh, Novogen's 10th anniversary. So we will persist on uh, providing you reliable services with extensive experience. And uh, uh, the labs around the world also, you can choose from, also can shorten your turnaround. So our end-to-end -end service manage every aspect of your genomic solutions. So you can focus on what you do best and let, let us take care of everything else. Yeah. And here shows Novogen achievements over the years. Uh, Novogen allows scientists to publish tons of papers in top journals, and we also have thousands of partners around the world, like hospitals, companies, research organizations, and universities. Uh, here shows our uh, service uh, overview in genome service, uh, survey of human animal genomes, sequencing, human plant animal de novo sequencing, and some sequencing. In transcriptome services, we have MR sequencing, non-coding R sequencing, ISOM sequencing using PET file, and uh, basically we have the new single cell platform for the single cell gene expression and spatial transcriptomics. And our experts will lend their uh, on-site service uh, to, uh, for your single cell projects from the uh, project design, uh, library prep, and uh, uh, the data analysis. So if you have any interest on the single cell gene expression, you can contact us. And I will uh, introduce microbial services uh, in more details later. And the fourth part is the epigenomic services. We have ChIP-seq, chip -seq, GBS. And the last part is the oncology services. We have NOVA PM, uh, NOVA Focus, and clinical WES. And that's the uh, overview of NOVA gene services. And uh, for the uh, for the uh, microbiome services, for microbiome we have shotgun metagenomics uh, and MTCOM based metagenomics. And if you would like to uh, look at the gene expression, and we also have the meta transcriptomics. Uh, and for pure culture, we have genome de novo sequencing, uh, genome resequencing, and also have the prokaryotic RNA seq. So you can, uh, based on your uh, research objective, uh, objectives, and uh, choose the sequence platform to decide which 
uh, microbial surveys you want to do. And here's the good news that uh, we update our applicant analysis pipeline from CHAM version 1.7 to CHAM 2, offering customer uh, ASV analysis. If you want to learn more about the key features of CHAM 2, uh, and you can search this website to, uh, see, uh, to learn more details. Uh, as we all know, the CHAM version 1.9 and below cannot support it by pipeline developer and the community. Uh, CHAM2 is a next generation microbiome bioinformatic platform that is free, open source, community developed. Uh, the advantage of CHAM2 is you can automatically track your analysis with uh, your data province and uh, interactive, uh, interactively explore your data with beautiful visualizations. And you can also share your results with your team, even those members without CHAMP2 installed. And this uh, CHAMP2 is also a plugin based system. All your uh, favorite microbiome uh, methods are in one place. And this is the Novogen CHAMP2 analysis uh, pipeline. Uh, and we will QC first, we will do the risk uh, merging field, uh, text filtration to of data to get the clean data, uh, and we will use data too to do the denoise and the remove uh, cameras uh, because of the PCR. And uh, we also will fill out the uh, abundance less than five to get the final AS. And the, each AS we will be used to do the uh, to uh, an annotated the species for species. And then we will do the alpha diversity and beta diversity. Uh, alpha diversity uh, is used to uh, analyze the uh, microbial community in the samples, and beta diversity is used to uh, represent the comparison of microbial communities. And in order to uh, further explore the difference between the microbial uh, community structures, uh, the statistic method like t-test, metastat, LIFC are used to analyze the significance of uh, in different uh, community. And also uh, in our pipeline, uh, we can use the peak rust to do the function prediction. So uh, when you do the uh, MTCAN project, uh, how to choose between the ASV and OTU? Uh, ASV stands for empty sequence variance. Uh, unlike the OTU, uh, OTU uh, stands for operational taxonomic units. And uh, OTU will uh, cluster, uh, if the two sequence has 97% similarity, uh, it will cluster into one OTU. And for the ASV, it's just compare sequence and similarity. Uh, if the uh, similarity is over 99%, it will call it one ASV. And so the taxonomy annotation on uh, uh, use ASV is on exact sequencing. Uh, uh, while the OTU is on the uh, present based on the presentive sequencing. Uh, so the ASV has higher microbial diversity resolution. It can uh, analyze up to the species uh, level and the OTU has lower microbial resolution, diversity resolution, it can uh, up to genus level. So because of ASV using the exact sequence, so it's the uh, quality uh, has higher impact on downstream analysis, uh, while the OTU, the read quality has lower impact on downstream analysis. And if you use ASV, uh, the, uh, the, uh, it can readily compare the between studies, but if you use OTU, uh, it needs reanalysis if new data is added. And ASV needs higher computational requirement while OTU needs lower computational requirement. So if you have a new project, we recommend you to use the ASV. And if, if you have a continued project, you want to keep the same method, uh, you can go for, uh, go for the OTU. Uh, so we have, uh, and uh, uh, if you are interested in knowing services, you can contact our strong commercial team. Uh, uh, they have lots of experiments and they are very help, happy to uh, help you start your ingest journal.
Okay, next, uh, move to the next part. Uh, hello, Dr. Chen. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, you can uh, introduce you yourself briefly and start your uh, presentation, over to you. Okay, so let me share my screen first. Yes. Okay, I wish everybody can see my slides, yes. Okay, yeah, great. Good afternoon, thank you for your attention. Uh, I would like to thank Novogen for this opportunity to share some of our insights in human microbiome with you. And actually, today's topic is quite broad. And since there's many very, very outstanding scientists in Hong Kong working on human microbiome and the relevant diseases. So my talk today just represent very superficial working progress by our own team. So I have no conflict of interest. So I would like to briefly introduce uh, some of our research interests. Mainly we are focusing on the molecular genomics and the evolution of microorganism in order to understand the complex interactions between host and microbiome, as well as the host pathogen causality which may help us to solve some biological problems that impact our health. Meanwhile, we also feel interested in the molecular genomics and epidemiology of emerging respiratory uh, infections, uh, such as COVID-19, seasonal influenza, and the bacterial pneumonia. But mainly we are based on the molecular genomics. And meanwhile, I joined the Center for Gut Microbiome Research in CUHK. So, our aim is to understand the role of microbiome or microbiota in health and diseases, as well as exploring novel strategies in uh, predicting, uh, prevention, or the intervention, uh, uh, interventing diseases based on characterizing or modulating human microbiome community. So in the following, I would like to introduce a few of the select topics or project we are going on. First is the Hong Kong gut microbiome map. So this is one we actually three years ago, we set up a study on gut microbiome of healthy persons in Hong Kong population. So SASTI is actually the first of its kind of aiming at establishing uh, a reference database uh, of gut microbiome in Hong Kong population. As we know, uh, some gut microbiota could be highly variable between ethnic geography or diet. So we want to build our own reference. Uh, identifying key determining factors uh, of gut microbiome in our local population, and which could also serve a reference to compare against other population with or without disease. Uh, so currently we have finished phase one, uh, by collecting around 500 uh, participators for their gut microbiome, uh, uh, fecal samples, as well as uh, over 100 mm, demographic information factors. And we are also uh, moving to phase two, a kind of uh, longitudinal study uh, to understand the dynamics of gut microbiota community changes uh, in association with lifestyle or other environmental factors. And secondly, it's a, uh, it's a kind of collaboration with Department of Medicine. Uh, so to establish a kind of fecal microbiota biobanker. So uh, this is one to provide uh, a kind of quality assumed uh, stool samples uh, for fecal microbiota transplantation to support a clinical servers and uh, some clinical trials. And the third one is a collaboration with the part of pediatrics, uh, we call Smart Baby, to understand the dynamic change of gut microbiota uh, at, during birth of baby through uh, several years monitoring of gut microbiota changes uh, to adult, uh, not adult, uh, uh, 
uh, maybe the teenager, but I guess this is a, a bit long-term plan we are still going on. And also, we feel interested in the microbiota in cancer, a kind of uh, case control study to understand the association uh, between human microbiota, host genetic and epigenetic events, and also some kind of uh, ep uh, demographic information or other pathogens in mainly we are focusing on the oral cancer and the gastrointestinal cancer uh, based in Hong Kong population or patients. Uh, so uh, before I go to my own data, I would like to give some uh, brief introduction of human microbiome and also the common approaches uh, we may apply for our research. And actually, as we all know that, that many individual bacteria and fungi or viruses are highly pathogenic to our health. And uh, that picture on the left panel, actually you can see many uh, pathogen uh, we know very well. But indeed, we are a genetic and the metabolic composed of microbiome and the human cells. Uh, we call this is a kind of superorganism, meaning we have our own first genome from parents, but also we have our second genome of microbiome. And the human microbiome is a kind of community composed of highly diversified microorganisms, including bacteria, fungi, virome, and also their genes. And uh, which is quite critical in health and disease. For example, over 90% of disease probably are directly or indirectly linked to human microbiome. As an, uh, as an adult, for example, we have probably around two to three kilograms of bacteria in total, composed probably more than 10,000 species bacteria. And uh, in number, probably that's 10 times higher in, uh, than the human cells. And also probably 100 times higher uh, in gene than human genome. And uh, actually, for example, human to human or person to person, we share more than 99.9% .9 genome. Uh, I mean, the, our whole first genome. But actually, 90 to, uh, 80 to 90% of microbiome quite a different uh, person by person. So actually we meet a kind of dynamic ecology. So usually we are talking about, when I'm talking about human microbiome, we're also talking about kind of ecosystem. And at the very beginning, we also assume, and we uh, get the bacteria during birth, we call it the equicristive ecosystem. Okay, so like, you know, baby, so we have some, you know, very high conserved microbiome on the surface or inside the outside body. And the following, uh, we call it the niche adaptation or uh, succession. Uh, microbiome may evolve and differentiate, resulting in different ecosystem between body size, like the skin versus mouth or versus gut. Uh, the community becomes quite different, so-called different ecosystem. But because of being uh, within uh, each community, for example, because of importance of their biological property, so actually person to person, we usually share quite identical bacteria uh, or particularly quite common characteristics. So we also call a kind of common ecosystem. So which means our gut microbiota from a population usually will share a core composition in composition and abundance. But of course, these are kind of dynamics. And particularly when certain bacteria become the overgrowth or, or, or a kind of variance uh, has been disrupted, uh, resulting in uh, dysbiosis or microbiome, so which may be linked to certain disease. So what we also call rearranged uh, ecosystem. So indeed, microbiome is a kind of balance between uh, homostatic with increased diversity 
we call it a healthy condition and also perturbation reduce diversity. This is kind of interaction of microbiome among uh, also between the host, uh, influenced by host and also environmental factors. Uh, this is a kind of list, I guess many audience know that well. So I won't talk too much, but I will take example, for example, gut microbiome, since this is uh, ecosystem uh, harboring the vast majority of microbiome. And so usually uh, in a house, microbiota compose a balanced uh, representation of uh, symbiotics, so which means this is a good bacteria, which benefit our health. And also sometimes it overgrows, so like we call the pestle uh, about a uh, balance, which may uh, uh, have a kind of potential or uh, pathology. So a shift from uh, towards that uh, dysbios usually results from a decrease in good bacteria and also the promotion of the bad bacteria. And uh, for example, uh, the low bacteria gene counts have also been associated with a lot of gut microbiota functions and dysbiosis and have been linked to uh, increase, for example, the fat accumulation, uh, emulation, uh, some kind of uh, in insulin resistance uh, or other kind of diseases like obesity and uh, particular uh, metabolic diseases. And also gut microbiota are served as a central, could it be associated with many, uh, like could it be locally and also systematically uh, associated with uh, different uh, body size or different system. For example, we uh, call some uh, gut uh, brain access you know, or gut may, uh, with other you know, oral or other body size access. So uh, actually gut microbiome is really important in regulating uh, immune, uh, immune uh, protection, uh, metabolic function as well. And also around 20% of cancer could be associated with pathogenic infections. So here is an example of the uh, on the inflammatory by which the microbiota contribute to uh, colorectal uh, cancer, for example. Uh, for example, the microbiome delivered uh, short-chain uh, fatty acids usually can induce IL-10, for example, which can uh, dampen inflammation. But sometimes overgrowth of some uh, harmful bacteria or some uh, toxin could mm, trigger inflammation by IL-10 deficiency, uh, deficiency, for example, uh, leading to uh, alert uh, innate immunity or a promoted epithelium proliferation uh, in cancer cell environment, particularly, for example, uh, the peptochococca and the fusel bacterium, and they could uh, trigger the secretion of uh, chemoketers or directly inhibit the cytotoxic activity of natural killer cells, for example. So it's probably involved in the immune reactions. So while well, traditional microbiology and uh, microbiome research, particularly at the very beginning of the same sequencing, so we highly rely on the culture methods. But um, very early stage sequencing on, for example, target gene like 16S have been uh, reveal a high diversity of microbiome in nature samples, meaning so the vast majority of micro, uh, microbiome diversity uh, could be missed by culture-based methods. So uh, at, uh, initially as introduced, uh, so uh, with the quick development of the nectar drug reaching sequencing, um, mainly represented by Illumina and or PackBio platform for uh, short read and long read sequencing. So uh, molecular genomics and uh, related research in life science has been a largely a promoted. So mainly when we look at back to the microbiome uh, sequencing method, actually many people apply for one is a target gene sequencing, providing a quick profiling of the bacteria composition and abundance, a kind of taxonomy profiling. 
Of course, we also can go to the shotgun metagenomics to understand the overall gene composition, which may provide us a more comprehensive understanding of the uh, function and also the changes. Uh, sometimes we also can look at the onion level uh, transcription to see the reactions upon a certain condition. And also like the whole genome, I guess it's quite similar as the short gun. So in details, actually, uh, this is a slide I uh, just give you a very, very brief uh, understanding of the uh, sequence based uh, uh, surveys of microbiota. I uh, usually, uh, or mainly, we are focusing on the uh, DNA level genomic sequencing that could be on target one, like 16S for bacteria and the ITS for fungi, which provide a quick understanding of the composition. This method is really useful for those samples with lower biomass, particularly for some uh, uh, small samples uh, which have high genomic. Uh, gen uh, genomic contamination. And of course, if you know you want to expand more understanding about function, particularly working on the gut microbiota, since uh, by, uh, for fecal samples, usually over 60% of genome probably uh, were from bacteria. So in that case, short gun uh, sequencing provides a really good you know, method to understand the overall gene and the genome for function uh, and, and also pathway understanding. Of course, many uh, research groups focusing on the onion level, a uh, transcription, a uh, protein level, and the small molecular level for the metabolic profiling. So actually, this is a kind of conversation. And actually, in uh, my team, usually I work on the 16S uh, gene amicron profiling and the whole genome DNA metagenomics. So uh, for I will show some few uh, working progress from my own team on the bacteria dysbiosis in cancer. Mainly we will look at the coronary cancer and also uh, another one is the head and neck cancer. And with a specific focus on one bacteria we call a fusel bacterium. The reason we feel interested in fusel bacterium since numerous publications found the uh, enrichment of the related abundance of fusel uh, in the tumor tissue of colorectal cancer uh, compared to the normal controls. And uh, actually, this a lot of paper have been shown. This is the real evidence showing fusel bacteria nucleotum infection may involve in CRC tumor genesis. And uh, also, uh, several uh, fusel nucleotum, uh, I guess, virus gene or protein, for example, FAP2 uh, FAP or FADA, have been proved to invade human epithelial cells and also uh, may induce oncogenic gene impression and promote growth of uh, CRC uh, cells, for example. Uh, so uh, also fusel bacteria was reported to be uh, persisting in uh, primary metastasis coronal cancer tumor and also can promote uh, chemo resistance to a uh, drug treatment through the Modeling the autophage. So, for this sense, so we are wondering what's the real uh, profile of fusel bacteria in uh, gastrointestinal tract in Hong Kong population. So, actually, since we are working on a big sample cohort size for the human gut microbiota map, so we uh, look at the, all the genome, short gun genomic data to see how the abundance of overall bacteria in fecal uh, samples and also how abundance of the fusel bacteria in specific. So the methodology is quite general. So we have the extra DNA and with help of knowledge for metagon short, uh, short gun metagenomic sequencing. So through a kind of pipe, my bioinformatic pipeline, so we have the result of the overall OTU table, uh, function profiling, and particularly, we do the de novo assembling to get the, uh, the context, which could help to build some meaning for a genome of certain bacteria to characterize the gene. So for example here, of course, besides of our Hong Kong population, we also access over uh, more than 3000 uh, metadata from over 10 uh, population representing other you know, country or other ethics. So 
uh, overall, we can see uh, a gut microbiome could be a bit diversity uh, based on the principal component analysis. And some population could be sh uh, shared in uh, community, but some may distinct. And we all know very well that, you know, this could be the, a result of the different ethic or diet and some kind of the uh, uh, drug population. But also I would like to mention or highlight the methodology things. If that's a different sample processing in attraction or sequencing platform, which may also get some different or biased result. But overall, we know that well that in the gut microbiome on the phylum level, uh, bacteria uh, reduce and this uh, formicultures are two main predominant bacteria. But this is just you know, a, a quite you know, introduction, but we feel more interested in the, uh, the, the abundance or the diversity of fusel bacteria in, uh, or, or at the overall of the genus in stool samples. So actually we can see in either uh, a no CRC, I mean the healthy population or the CRC gut microbiota population, we can see a high diversity of fusel bacteria species composed of many different species. Besides all the fusel nucleotum, so in here, this is one we know very well, which induced the uh, probably induced, uh, induced the coronary cancer. But we also see uh, many other bacteria in reach, uh, particularly when we compare the our, you know, uh, Chinese population, because in, besides Hong Kong, we also see some you know, mainland like China, Zhejiang, and Shenzhen. And uh, this is uh, healthy, and this is CRC. And interesting that, you know, compared to other job with the cooperation, we see a bit high abundance of fusel bacteria indeed, and also particularly the high abundance of fusel nucleotide uh, value, and also like the, in the Greek area. And uh, uh, of course, the major majority is in this one, so we call them uh, fusel bacteria uh, multifolium. So uh, this is a one a kind of interesting observation saying, uh, fusel nucleotide could be quite different between the population. So in such sense, we also look at the so overall genomic diversity of the, uh, of the whole genome, uh, whole, whole genus of fusel bacteria. And actually it's composed of at least four big grades, including fusel and then A, B, C. Of course, this is quite a good taxonomy and we can rearrange, or, or, but, uh, but mainly they follow the phylogenetic association. And this is the main group, you know, composed of fusel nucleotide, which can built to the oncogenicity. And, but also we see uh, some uh, group, you know, may also highly abundant in our Chinese population, also particularly in the coronary cancer uh, case uh, samples. And so this, which may raise a question that whether why some kind of no fusel back nucleotide also could be uh, increased in the, particularly in the CRC cohort. So uh, given the, um, a previous understanding of the FADA and FAP2 gene are uh, closely related to the oncogenicity. So we look at these two gene homologies uh, overall and find that uh, as aspect of fusel nucleotide, actually we can do brief the present presence of these two genes. But interesting, we also can see the alzheim and the varium who two uh, common, a uh, highly abundant uh, uh, Fusel species also contain a Z2 gene in prime. They may contribute a kind of the uh, role in tumor genesis, particularly in our Chinese population. So this is kind of a, a straightforward uh, presentation. Uh, so I will uh, give some key messages based on this work. So for example, no CRC source to our Chinese population may carry multiple non and a novel fusel bacterium taxonomy phylogenetic tree distinct from nucleotide. And uh, uh, so, some uh, no fusel nucleotide also could be associated with uh, CRC. And particularly the large of the FADA enhancing what detect in several uh, species like the fusel varium and the fusel uh, nucleosarium, suggesting potential association with CRC and the disease. Uh, uh, this finding may indicate that the CRC in South Chinese population, particularly like for our population in Hong Kong, may be linked with uh, uh, fusel varium and other bacteria in addition to fusel nucleotide. But of course, you know, the function 
uh, investigation for this bacteria species uh, warrant future uh, study. So actually this work has been published. And so uh, we may know that fusel nucleotum actually is a key bacteria in our cavity. And so this bring our hypothesis that whether the fusel nucleotum also could contribute to some disease in our cavity. So uh, in case we have, since we have an ongoing project on, uh, to understand the overall microbiome in HNCC, since you know, this is a kind of uh, multiple factor involved cancer, actually we don't know too much about the etiology, but of course we know like smoking, drinking as a key one, but uh, we also see in many cases no smoking, no drinking. So we want to see why or what's the issue of uh, microbiome in uh, uh, contributing uh, the HNCC. So in such a uh, sense, so we have a very simple study design to understanding or to, uh, to understand the, uh, the oral microbiota uh, diversity uh, between a uh, tumor and the uh, adjacent normal tissue. Meanwhile, we collect the oral rings from both HNCC patient and also another group of healthy controls with uh, age and the gender match uh, population to compare the difference uh, between oral rings. And of course, we also look at the uh, tissue samples and we apply the seeking as only V3, V4 sequencing. Since as I mentioned before, uh, this is a very good way to uh, get bacteria composition, particularly those, you know, about uh, biopsy low samples. So this is quite general. So we apply V3, V4 and uh, using uh, barcode primers and it goes through my six sequencing and it goes to the time two uh, pipeline to get the overall uh, OTU and phylogenetic information. So as a result of particular alpha and beta diversity analysis, we can see decreased diversity in tumor tissue compared to an uh, adjacent normal tissue. Uh, less observation in all ring samples probably is not so relevant, but in the tissue samples, we do see quite you know, interesting uh, result. And particularly among overall, you know, more than 100 uh, uh, or, or oral bacteria genus, uh, we could observe at least 12 uh, descriptive bacteria could distinguish tumor from AN. And particularly, we can see a dramatic increase in abundance of fusel bacteria in uh, tumor tissue compared to the adjacent normal tissue. Uh, in contrast, we also see uh, the decrease of streptococca in tumor tissue, which both could provide a very good for uh, biomarkers for a kind of early diagnostics. And uh, since seeking as only can provide us uh, some information on the genus level, so we also expected to look at the, uh, the species information to see whether fusel nucleotum or other species is introduced to the tumor genesis. So in such case, we you apply the uh, uh, immunostaining actually we can really observe the localization of fusel nucleotum in the FFPE slide. And also this has been converted by our uh, RT-PCR we didn't show here. So showing fusel nucleotum could be uh, a kind of positive associated bacteria in HNCC. And uh, this are kind of enough uh, social analysis see whether fusel bacteria could be linking to the clinical outcome. But very interesting that we can see, uh, usually the enrichment of fusel uh, could be observed in no smoker. Uh, that's quite interesting. So you're showing the so, uh, no smoker guy with HNCC probably uh, it is the reason of the uh, enrichment of the fusel. Uh, also we can, uh, surprisingly we can see the uh, enrichment of fusel uh, actually it's associated with fat survival. And uh, which means fusel could be a pri uh, play a role in the early stage of the disease. And this could be find the fusel bacteria, but high abundance is uh, key uh, factors associated with uh, fat survival. And uh, meanwhile, we also look at a kind of interactive analysis between uh, 
bacteria and the maceration. And uh, we suspect to look at the fusel necratum to see whether uh, so enrichment of fusel could be associated with host gene or maceration in that promoter area. And interesting, we can find some uh, positive and the negative association uh, between the enrichment of fusel necratum and hypo and hypo maceration. Uh, as we know that hypo and hypo gene, host gene maceration could be associated with the uh, uh, gene re expression regulation. So uh, actually we can do the uh, only see, you know, our samples, but we look at the TCG, HNCC uh, data sets. See, for example, this group, uh, green bar, uh, blue bar, sorry, means uh, uh, depressed, which means, you know, high hypermaceration could be linked to the depression expression. And I just showed one, two example, like the one gene is LXN and also SMARCA2, both uh, we look, look at it as a tumor suppressed gene and it could be associated with inflammatory uh, response and the cell uh, migration. And so in suggesting a fusel nucleotum infection in gene uh, dysregulation could be linked to the inflammation response and cell proliferation uh, through epigenetic silencing. Uh, of course, again, I also would highlight to say that, you know, this is just a kind of observation, see the relationship. We still are uh, in the very early stage of the causality of the fusel and the cancer. And of course, we are working on some kind of function study to understand the bacteria in carcinogenicity. So in that case, we do uh, anaerobic culture to isolate fusel bacteria in our uh, HNCC tumor tissues. And so we have two purposes. One is to characterize the whole genome of uh, those isolated bacteria. And so we actually also have, uh, receive service from Novagen to get the whole genome of bacteria. And we apply the Illumina short read and also apply the PEC file long research uh, sequencing for bacteria whole genome and to characterize particular uh, whole genome characterization. This is a kind of work in progress. We are still in stage of accumulation of the, uh, the genome and particularly to establish a link between phenotype and genotype from different clinical source. And the second purpose definitely we want to see the potential function of fusel nucleotide in uh, inducing HNCC uh, carcinogenicity. So actually we, for example, we have a kind of co-culture system uh, by culturing a fusel in a uh, uh, oral cell line and which can get you know, some uh, dramatic change a uh, pathway and function. For example, uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, I put, put a small uh, word and by actually we can see a kind of uh, increase in the, some uh, 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 complement system and an OD-like receptor signaling pathway. Uh, could be associated with uh, uh, that associated with the immune response and the carcinogenicity uh, could be uh, both activated, so increase upon the fusel bacteria infection. And some pathway uh, probably uh, depressed, uh, for example, FOXO, FOXO signaling pathway, uh, uh, which could act as the tumor suppressor, mm, be depressed. And also in the co-culture, we can see a kind of promoter uh, contribution in cell proliferation, which could be proved by the, uh, for example, cell migration by wood heating. And so uh, actually we are just providing a show or, you know, a work in progress on the human microbiome, particularly the gene in cancer. But again, I also would like to highlight all our data right now, just kind of described here. So actually we don't know really our uh, microbiome is still in oral cavity or cancer still is a driver or passenger. And this is a kind of story of chicken or egg, which is the egg first. And, but of course, you know, through our study in HNCC, we could observe a kind of this bios or oral microbiota associated with HNCC. And also we can find some uh, this, uh, this, this descriptive taxonomy of bacteria, which could serve as a kind of useful marker for early diagnostics. And uh, fusel nucleotum, associated with snow smoking and the bad survival in HNCC. And actually we also see some uh, a promise function 
are contributing to the carcinogenicity. But again, uh, whether this is kind of consortial relationship, one of the fields of investigation in function and the mechanism. And also we are one ongoing project to understand the dynamic change of oral microbiota in HNCC uh, following the post-surgery. See whether, uh, for example, the restoration of oral microbiota could be associated with kind of the, uh, treatment. So this work has been published in cancers. And lastly, I would like to share uh, or, or thank my you know, uh, research team, uh, mainly focused on HNCC at CUHK, like Dr. Jason and Dr. Paul and the many other doctors and uh, our colleagues who uh, form a very excellent team uh, to uh, build a fruitful contribution. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen, for sharing your uh, human microbiome research associated with uh, clinical researches. And uh, next, I'd like to invite Dr. Nirajang to talk about the uh, topic uh, dermatitis. dermatitis. Hello, Nirajang. How are you? Good. Hi. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be at this uh, webinar to share some of our work on skin microbiome research. It's also great to see a diversity of, uh, in the audience all across Asia. Um, and uh, thanks for the wonderful um, presentation as well as introduction, uh, which, um, which sort of set us up for this uh, more focused um, presentation on skin microbiome. So my lab at the Genome Institute of Singapore is a computational biology lab. Um, so we are interested in new uh, algorithms and methods to analyze uh, shotgun metagenomic data in terms of uh, doing assembly, uh, modeling community dynamics, and then associating that with various uh, human phenotypes. Uh, in this case, I will be telling you about our skin microbiome work, but we also look at uh, the impact of various uh, pathogens uh, in the gut microbiome and how uh, colonization by multidrug resistant bacteria can, uh, key, can be uh, uh, altering the gut community and perhaps uh, um, modulating the gut microbiome can reduce the risk of transmission of antimicrobial resistance. So um, in particular, the skin microbiome work that I'll be presenting today is a series of uh, papers that we have done on atopic dermatitis which as many of you probably know, is a very common skin condition, particularly affecting uh, the quality of life in children. Uh, it's chronic, in, it's inflammatory, there's dry, itchy skin and, and recurrent lesions in children. Um, and the relationship between um, uh, microbes uh, and atopic dermatitis is, is primarily obviously seen in, from the prism of infections with herpes simplex virus infections uh, being known in a, a subset of individuals as well as the fact that uh, Staphylococcus aureus uh, is known to be enriched in individuals who have flares. So in the more acute presentation of this disease, uh, it's already known that the uh, skin uh, is almost monocolonized by Staphylococcus aureus. But it is known to have complex pathogenesis by which I mean that there are many factors. Uh, there's uh, the skin barrier, the skin genetics, and uh, the barrier integrity that's there in a susceptible individual. The, the, in, the environment, uh, and in particular, the microbiome is a, is a, is a function of the environment, um, as well as the immune response to the, the microbiome, as well as the barrier defect uh, that might be present in individuals. So the, these complex interactions are uh, important to study uh, if you want to understand uh, uh, the, this relatively heterogeneous disease with many endotypes across individuals. So as I said earlier, uh, skin microbiome in AD has been primarily studied uh, in the context of the flare condition where we know that the diversity of the community goes down and that's primarily because uh, there's a mono uh, colonization uh, dominance of Staphylococcus species, particularly Staph aureus, and it's believed to have a pathogenic role in, under this condition. But uh, this uh, flare-affected microbiome goes back to a baseline state. Um, at least that's what was understood um, till we started asking this question, 
where, which is that uh, in the non-flare state, in, in a situation where uh, um, a child does not have um, uh, overtly unusual skin, um, can the microbiome in this state help us predict a predisposition to this disease? Uh, could this skin microbiome, the non-flare skin microbiome, help us stratify individuals uh, based on who might be most susceptible? And finally, could we treat the disease uh, based on these non-flare skin microbiome? So it's a bit like uh, looking at the microbiome as a, a susceptibility factor, as a bit like post genetic studies. So in order to do this, uh, we wanted to take a new approach when we started this work in 2016, uh, where we were trying to use a, a case control study, um, but also use shotgun metagenomics, as has been described. Uh, shotgun metagenomics has many advantages uh, in terms of looking at different uh, components of the microbiome, including archaea, fungi, and viruses, but also uh, uh, gives you a direct uh, data for looking at pathways and, and virulence, so, uh, looking at microbial function, and uh, um, you know the uh, uh, the sophisticated. Um, facilities that are now available in, in various sequencing providers allow us to do this sort of high throughput uh, studies. So in a cohort of, of individuals in Singapore, uh, we had uh, many controls, uh, about uh, 30 to 40 controls and 80 cases, and we compared them in terms of their uh, community diversity. And not surprisingly, because they were not in a flare state, we did not see a significant difference between cases and controls. But when you start looking at specific species and, and the differences in abundance of specific species, we observe differences in many species. So Malassezia are common skin fungi, Pneumococcus and Deinococcus are known commensals, and these are depleted in the case of AD, while some other species, including some of the oral species that were referred to earlier, uh, such as Streptococcus species, were enriched in uh, the AD cases. So this was quite interesting for us, and we tried to look into the function of, of these species. And one hypothesis that we had was perhaps uh, the Streptococcus species are competing uh, with the Staph aureus species in uh, uh, strains in the in uh, the human skin. And so we we did um, this sort of uh, inhibition assays, and we could see that uh, Strep mites in fact did inhibit Staph aureus, uh, and in fact another species uh, which is uh, Streptococcus sanguinis, which is also enriched in um, AD uh, subjects in our study, was can also inhibit Staph aureus under certain conditions. And doing um, a transcriptomics uh, with uh, this sort of co-culture analysis also gave us a hint into the pathways that might be playing a role. So Streptococcus mitis uh, uh, produces hydrogen peroxide uh, via the py pyruvate pathway, and this uh, can cause cell death in Staph aureus due to the lack of uh, catalase activity. So uh, this obviously was one angle that we saw as a role of the species we detected were enriched in atopic dermatitis. But another angle was the, uh, the immune response. Um, so uh, we exposed various human cells to the different microbes that we found were enriched or depleted in AD and uh, measured uh, uh, various uh, cytokines and chemokines. And what we observed was, uh, in terms of the flare-associated microbes, as Staphylococcus epidermidis and S. aureus, indeed there is a Th1 polarizing cytokine signature, as you can see on the right here. But uh, in terms of the depleted microbes, the AD-specific depleted microbes that are commensals, they elicit minimal immune response, uh, suggesting that even in the non-flare state, the shift that you might see in AD might actually be leading to a more pro-inflammatory environment. In addition, we looked at microbial metabolism. Um, so the fact that we had metagenomic data allowed us to uh, characterize the abund uh, abundance of various microbial pathways at the DNA level. Uh, and when we compared cases and controls, we found that uh, cases had an enrichment on nitrogen metabolism as well as arginine and proline metabolism and a depletion of tryptophan metabolism. Now, nitrogen metabolism and arginine and proline metabolism is, is known to play a role in, in production of ammonia, um, which uh, elevates pH and uh, thus uh, uh, is known to create a favorable environment for Staph aureus growth. But in addition, um, in later work after our publication, it's been shown that the tryptophan metabolism and the depletion 
uh, on on human skin because of uh, uh, because of the shift in the microbiome could play a role in modulating the immune response. So the microbiome now can cross talk with the immune system based on our microbial metabolism. And so we, we thought this was very interesting and we went ahead and looked at the specific genes that are played that play a role. And we find in fact that each of these genes is depleted uh, um, or enriched in the cases. So there's a increased capability for uh, converting arginine to ammonia. And in fact, if you look at arginine on, on human skin, uh, in the case of AD subjects, there's in fact lesser arginine as expected. So it's being converted uh, to ammonia and, and uh, uh, by microbial metabolism, presumably. And, and this contributes to a favorable niche for staph aureus. So the emerging uh, model that we have for eczema is that um, while in healthy skin, there's a polymicrobial community um, which does not get dramatically disrupted in, in, uh, in the non prior state, uh, there's still a shift uh, away from species which could uh, uh, be sort of com commensals and have a uh, low inflammatory, uh, uh, low, um, um, low uh, response in terms of the uh, immune uh, system, but, but also uh, a slight increase in species which could be keeping the staph aureus abundances in check. And when this break, this uh, prevention of uh, staph monodominance is disrupted, uh, that's when we get a, a flare condition where we get a dominance of staph aureus. And, and this triggers also immune response because of the pathogens in, uh, because of the pathogenic uh, elements uh, in, uh, in staph aureus, uh, the various virulence factors. So to study this further, we, we conducted a, a next study where we wanted to look at things longitudinally as well. Uh, as you know, the microbiome can um, uh, can be quite variable over time, and we wanted to do a study where we had uh, multiple time points, and we were looking at the stability of the community across time. So, my apologies. I'm going to take a pause here. I right. Okay. So, uh, in order to look at this, we uh, we use a two time point approach. And uh, uh, we wanted to uh, allow for um, um, standard of care in the middle uh, to see what the impact of that would be on, on the skin microbiome. Um, and also we wanted to look at various uh, other aspects of the skin microbiome, including skin surface uh, analysis, look at serum biomarkers, as well as the whole community profile. So again, using shortcut metagenomics, uh, we. Uh, visualized the taxonomic profiles that we have in, in a, in a uh, MDS scaled plot. So we uh, brought this high dimensional data down to two dimensions. Um, and when we did that, we observed that there's indeed a, a concentration of, um, uh, of microbiome profiles in a, in a distinct region of, of the space uh, shown by the blue circle here. And these seem to be enriched in uh, AD patients. So in fact, we, we can get uh, through a more formal clustering approach, uh, very robust clusters where one cluster is almost completely uh, uh, contributed by AD subjects. And another cluster is a mixture of AD as well as uh, uh, control subjects. So this is uh, different from our previous studies. So we, we are finding now that when we, when we widen our cohort and we look at more uh, severe AD patients, we can find a subset who have a distinct skin microbiome. And we call this configuration a dermatype. So dermatypes are largely stable. So individuals who of a particular dermatype stay within it in the next time point, uh, which is a month apart. But there are a few individuals that switch. And we observe that these switches happen when uh, they are um, bilaterally not uh, stable, which means their left and right microbiomes are not always consistent. Um, in, in this case, we are sampling the anticubital cells, which is a common uh, site for uh, uh, AD rashes. So in terms of um, uh, uh, clinical presentation, uh, individuals who belong to dermatite B, which I label as B here, they have a, a lot more severe uh, um, score, uh, which was measured with this uh, term called SCORAD for AD. And they also have higher uh, IgE levels and lower skin hydration. So there, there are indeed uh, obvious differences, uh, clinical differences in uh, dermatite B patients. But in other aspects, such as uh, trans water loss, uh, in terms of pH and in terms of natural moisturizing factors, which are all important uh, markers for 
uh, AD risk, we find that there are no differences. So to study this further, we wanted to now understand the, the taxonomic differences that we see uh, in dermatype B. And uh, if you remember earlier, I had shown that uh, AD versus control, there's no differences in the diversity, but in fact, dermatype B is distinct. So uh, this subset of individuals in AD actually have higher diversity. If you look at the full taxonomic profile, but if you look at uh, the profile uh, on the right here, you'll see that uh, dermatype B essentially is missing um, uh, this orange colored species, which is actually uh, cutibacterium species. So there's a depletion of cutibacterium species in many dermatite B subjects, which seems to be a, a marker of, of this community. And then if you, of course, subtract out cutibacterium, in fact, dermatite B is marked by a reduction in diversity. Um, and uh, in terms of, of the species that drive this reduction in drive diversity, there are many staphylococcal, staphylococcus species um, no, it's not just aureus, but also other species such as uh, capitis and epidermidis, which are sporadically enriched across individuals. So no, no one species is the dominant one in all subjects, but it's across individuals, suggesting that uh, what's happening perhaps is a cutibacterium depletion for whatever reason leads to a, a staphylococcus a, a favorable niche across staphylococcal species. But in addition, uh, there's a strong depletion of certain commensals. So Dermococcus is one that I mentioned earlier, but also methylobacterium, which was observed in our previous study as well. Uh, and um, in contrast to a previous study where we saw an enrichment of uh, Streptomyces, Streptomyces is actually depleted in Dermatype B, and Staph hominis is also depleted. These are both species that are known to uh, inhibit Staph aureus growth. And uh, in terms of pathways, again, we see the arginine signal where dermatype B is the one which actually has a strong arginine metabolism signal, as well as several staphylococcal virulence factors. So uh, it's well known that beta doxin and delta doxin uh, can elicit a very strong immune response. Uh, they cause mast cell degranulation uh, and sort of IL co production. So there's a lot known about this, but in fact, we can see that this. Uh, the difference uh, in these species uh, and the abundances in on skin is is, is strongly marked by these toxin uh, abundances as well. But in addition, uh, when you start looking at skin surface response, so this is host response, you find that uh, there are uh, key markers of antimicrobial response on on human skin. So alpha defensin and beta defensins that defend against microbes in, in human skin are strongly enriched in dermatype B, uh, as you can see on the left here, as well as proteases, again, uh, as antimicrobial response. So clearly, uh, dermatype B elicits both an immune response as well as an antimicrobial response on, on human skin, um, suggesting they are strongly linked. And then if you go beyond uh, human skin onto circulating cytokines and chemokines, again, there's a distinct dermatype B signature here. Uh, and there are um, specific uh, cytokines and chemokines which are strongly upregulated, so IL-13 and IL-8. Um, so this, all of this together uh, shows a strong picture of uh, a subtype of AD which might be microbially driven. Um, the, and this signature can even be seen in the non-flare uh, AD skin. Um, so when we went back into the clinical data, we actually observed that dermatite B contributes to more severe disease as in uh, subjects have more prone to flares. So the, the, perhaps the, the instability in the community and its favorable uh, nature to staph aureus uh, and staph species in general colonization leads to more flares, uh, more itch state, um, and therefore more severe disease. So skin surface biomarkers can actually distinguish AD uh, endotypes in addition to the immune markers that we've used in the past. And um, so with that, um, I, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I hope uh, this has been an uh, interesting uh, journey to understand the role of skin microbiome in this very common and important skin disease. Um, uh, Novogene uh, AIT has been, uh, been great partners in some of the metagenomic sequencing and analysis that we've done here. Um, this is, was a collaboration with the Skin Research Institute and HR Skin Research Laboratories now. Uh, in Dr. John Common's lab, um, uh, as well as our collaborators at the National Skin Center and the National University of Singapore. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention and we're very happy to address any questions.
Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Niyarjo. Uh, we have several questions. Uh, uh, first from Dr. Chen. Uh, from uh, first two questions from uh, Ta Takafumi. And uh, he asked, uh, Dr. Chen, do you think the benefit to prepare library in-house rather than sending DNA input to outsourcing and pros or cons? Okay, uh, actually, uh, a good question, but I guess, you know, uh, either should be okay, but I encourage the collaboration uh, to make the best, you know, the benefit uh, from both sides. So for me, usually for particular for gut microbiota, meta, a short gut metagenome sequencing, so we did DNA extraction, but usually just sends DNA for library pre uh, preparation to novelty. And I think mm -hmm. it overall the quality are good. And of course, you know, for some samples, you know, particularly you need some special requirement, some kind of modification or some, you know, a capture, uh, maybe you need uh, to prepare a library by yourself. This is a kind of option. Okay, thank you. And another question from him is about the database. Uh, for preparing or establish, uh, establishing microbiome database, I expect a gut microbiome. How may, how, how may, how may, Samples are requested at minimum. Do you have any comment on this? Uh, actually, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's no strict rule to say how many samples is good enough or big, uh, big enough. And uh, I assume this is the one you want to ask how to establish a reference database. And so, uh, uh, yeah, as we mentioned, or uh, we are working on the gut microbiota uh, in our, our local population. And so, Actually, for the first phase, we uh, recruit around 500 uh, participators and for uh, fecal sample collection. And for phase two, we also have around 500 participators, but a kind of longitudinal collection uh, by different, uh, like the on row and the six months and one year and a two year. So uh, actually, uh, I have no clear answer how many sam samples enough. Okay, I think it depends on which, what kind of microbiome database you want to uh, establish. And the third question uh, is, uh, hello, Dr. Uh, Professor Chen. Uh, thank you for the intriguing presentation on the role of uh, fuel cell bacterium in contributing CRC. I have two questions about the 16S sequencing. Is there any specific reason why uh, uh, V3 to V4 hyp uh, hypervariable region is used rather than V1 to V4, which covers the whole hypervariable region of bacteria in sequencing. And the okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, yeah, I can see, you know, that's a good question. And uh, mainly, I guess the five terminals of the seeking S provide a bit more hypervariable region information. So that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons many people focus on the V1 to V6, oh. for example. Yes. Okay. And uh, so uh, the reason we choose V3 to V4 because this is a region most uh, many publication target on. And also this is a kind of reasonable amp size covered by my P300, providing an overlapping region to get the full V3 V4. As you mentioned about V1 to V4, I'm not sure, but probably a bit longer and uh, which probably can be covered by uh, P300. So this could be the issue. And also if you amplify a bit longer, so PCR efficiency could be variable. And uh, we know the longer PCR application probably have a bit less efficiency in amplification. So, uh, also, the reason we use V3, V4, because uh, uh, we have some other previous study or other ongoing project using the same region, which may sometimes later we can do some comparable uh, study to each other. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay, thank you. The second question is, uh, do you think the differences in choosing the 16S region in sequencing will offer a different view in microbial community in CRC? I think uh, it's yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, mainly for individual project or study design, mm -hmm. I always we have particular like the case control study. We also have to recruit uh, like the, uh, the tumor sample as well as the uh, 
control. Uh, this could be healthy control can also be some kind of different stage of disease. So usually the difference will be uh, focusing on the comparison between uh, designed groups rather than uh, study by study. Because, you know, for example, study, you know, my team probably, if we use different uh, with, uh, 16S region, definitely will uh, get, get, you know, totally different uh, bacteria profiling or to information, yes. Okay, okay, thank you for your answering. And okay. uh, the uh, last two questions uh, to the Dr. Nguyen And the first question is, uh, uh, microbiology extraction from skin sample is sometimes difficult. Do we have any key points on protocol or any comment? Yeah, so um, in our um, experience, um, um, we, we, we use perhaps a different protocol from uh, from what others have used, which is um, using swabs. So this is something we did as part of protocol development in the lab uh, in our first metagenomic study, where we, we tested uh, using tape strips as a way of um, collecting sufficient biomass for shotgun metagenomics, um, as opposed to swabs, um, as well as a, a kind of a, a, um, um, a ring-based method where you keep a ring and you uh, put PBS in it and, and sort of scrape skin um, to, to kind of uh, aspirate out skin cells. So in our experience, the tape method uh, has a, a robustness to it. That's very useful. Um, we, we have about a 95% and above success rate in building libraries from it. So there's sufficient DNA. Um, and in terms of uh, contamination, uh, other than in, in, in uh, studies with children, where we, when we do the studies with adults and in most sites, we get sufficient DNA that we're not afraid uh, of so much of contamination, uh, though we obviously have controls to, uh, um, to account for that. Uh, and then we do find about 70% uh, of the reads we acquire are human genome um, and another 30% are microbial. Uh, we do not see any biases. So if you use the kind of uh, be, a bead beating protocol um, or even uh, enzymatic lysis, uh, the biases are, are not substantial. So in terms of the dominant species, they're very well uh, extracted in this approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, second question is, uh, how many samples do you use for different derm types? Uh -huh. I see you so, have them type A and B and switch. Right. Um, so, um, so the, uh, there's a probably two aspects to this question. The first is in, in our study, in our establishing the, the, the concept, uh, the idea of a dermatype, how many samples were involved in the study. And uh, I don't have a precise number, but I think it was above 150 samples. Uh, there were multiple samples per individual. Um, and, uh, but it, more in terms of, uh, the within individual variability, right? Um, would would across time would the, a person switch between dermatypes, and how frequently would, would they switch? And this is unfortunately something we don't have data, um, you know, to really be able to establish. But what we observed was with the most individuals, uh, by most I would say more than seventy percent of individuals retain their dermatype over a month despite standard of care treatment or or without kind of using some very unusual. Uh, um, skin cleaning protocols and so on. So uh, I, I think it's reasonably robust and others have also shown that uh, the skin microbiome can stay stable up to a year. So it's not as dynamic as one would have suspected from you know, something that is exposed to the environment. Uh, there are resident bacteria which have, uh, uh, which uh, exploit what the host provides in terms of the environment, in terms of uh, metabolites, and that's uh, reasonably stable uh, over time. Okay, thank you. Uh, the third question is, do you think topical probiotics are a good idea or would rather introduce microbial metabolites to restore skin health? Okay, I, I, I can't answer that question with any data that I have in my hand, uh, but I can speculate if you want me to. Uh, and my speculation is based on our uh, atopic dermatitis work uh, where we can and, and as well as a, a broader study in the skin microbiome that we're doing right now, where we see quite often that uh, individuals have high abundance of certain species, um, quite often staph species, sometimes QT bacterium, uh, sometimes streptococcus species. 
Um, and what this suggests to me is that it's very easy uh, to have clonal dominance of certain species on human skin. Uh, what impact it has on human skin, we don't fully understand other than for Staph aureus, which seems to be associated with AD flares. Um, so if I had to be conservative, I would say the, the metabolites uh, or say prebiotics might be the right way to do things, uh, where um, you don't run the risk of uh, um, a species taking over the community. Um, but I think, again, this is a fascinating area that needs further study. Okay, thank you. Thank you for answering. The next question is to Dr. Chen. Uh, for the Hong Kong gut microbiome, do you plan to investigate how your population differentially responds to para, uh, pharmacology uh, treatments, maybe uh, chemotherapeutic drugs? Sorry. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. And for Hong Kong gut microbiota project, we for first stage, we mainly focus on the healthy population to build a reference database. And, uh, but of course we have some uh, collaboration uh, like the, to investigate gut microbiota dysbiosis uh, to obesity and diabetes, uh, which may involve in the treatment. And, uh, but for our oral uh, cancer project, we do look at the chemical therapy uh, a response, uh, particularly we want to see how all microbiota will be changed after the uh, chemical therapy or laser treatment, uh, for example. But actually this is a really good direction and but we are still on the early stage of the research. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, what, what do you think about nanopore in sequence and analysis of rectal samples to detect the microbiome? Uh, the question to me? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, uh, actually we, uh, uh, with help of knowledge to get the whole genome using the PEC bio and also nanopore. And so, because you know, the many you know, highly diverse of bacteria genome, particularly, for example, the repeated gene insertions. So Illumina short read sometimes cannot give us a comprehensive profiling of the genome, which rely on the long reads to build the genome structure. And uh, so for example, fusel bacteria have five copies of 16S. So, uh, but using the PEC bio and nanopore, we can build back the whole genome in one context, yes. But of course, you know, of nanopore has some issue of the sequence error. So best mm -hmm. way could be a composition of the short reads by Illumina and the long reads by nanopore or pack bio to get a very accurate, you know, output. Yes. Okay, okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chen. Thank you, Nian Jiang, for sharing your research and answering these questions. Uh, I think the time is up and we will uh, end out today's webinar. And thank you again for attending this webinar and hope you have a 